Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Church here in Fall River, Massachusetts, as we welcome the Reverend Richard Trudeau. This is not new ministerial costume. This is me forgetting my jacket at home. <laughs> Welcome to the Unitarian Church in Fall River, where we think religious questions are important, but we want to work out our own answers, and where we gather to share ideas and support one another. We gather this hour as people of faith, having sorrows and joys and needs and gifts. We light this beacon of hope as a sign of our quest for truth and meaning and in celebration of the life we share together. Could we join please in our opening hymn number 311, Let It Be a Dance. Let's go. 
Affirmation in the order of service. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. Please be seated. The service today is by three old white male Unitarian ministers. Uh, I'm one, but more, <laughs> but more importantly, Rick Maston is the second. He's no longer with us. Um, Rick Maston is the man who wrote the hymn we just sang. And Robert Fulgham, whose most famous book was called All I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You, you, you may remember that. It was a bestseller, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, Rick Maston, in particular, um, was a poet, and he would accompany his poems with drawings that he called one-liners. And the, the drawing on the cover is, is one of his. It's a, a matador, a bullfighter. And he, called it, he calls it a one-liner because it's drawn with one continuous line. And this is the illustration that went with a poem of his I would like to recite for you. It's, it's a poem of his called Bad Taste. And it, it, uh, I find it amusing and I find it wonderfully revelatory of, of Rick Maston's ability not to take himself very seriously. Uh, it, it takes place, he's talking to a woman who has a, a purple naugahyde sofa above which is hung a painting of a bullfighter on black velvet. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these paintings of bullfighters on black velvets. They're widely available in the southwestern part of this country, and they're considered by many people, including Rick Maston, to be in terrible taste. So here's his, here's his poem. Above the purple naugahyde sofa hung a bullfighter on black velvet. Don't you love the way he seems to glow, she said, and then went on to say that she thought that I was one of the finest poets writing in America today. <laughs> We're having a potluck next Sunday. I'm moving into announcements. We're having a potluck next Sunday. And uh, the memorial service for David Renke is a week from Saturday. So it's, it's Saturday, April 20th. What time? At two in the afternoon, two. here. And, and I think we're going to do like refreshments, like, uh, I'll be bringing refreshments for that. Um, 
Bringing what? Refreshments. We'll we'll have coffee and, and, and light refreshments afterward. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Shall I bring something? Sure. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Are there other announcements? As a meditation today, I'd like to read uh, another poem by Rick Maston, this one more serious. Uh, it's about, well, seeing the glass is half full or half empty. It's, it's about, um, it's called Poor Devil, Poor Devil. That's why I say it. Poor, Poor yeah. Devil. Thank you. Yeah. Poor devil. In my early 20s, I went along with Dylan Thomas, boasting that I wanted to go out, not gently, but raging, shaking my fist, staring death down. However, this daring statement was somewhat revised when in my 40s I realized that death does the staring, I do the down. <laughs> so I began hoping it would happen to me like it happened to the sentry 
in all those John Wayne Fort Apache movies, the sentry found dead in the morning, face down, an arrow in his back. Poor devil, the sergeant always said, never knew what hit him. At the time, I liked that, the end taking me completely by surprise. Older and wiser now, over 70, and with a terminal disease, the only thing right about what the sergeant said was the poor devil part. The poor devil never had a chance to tell loved ones one more time that he loved them. The poor devil never had the opportunity to give praise one more time for the sunrise or drink in a sunset. How much fuller, richer, and pleasing life becomes when you are lucky enough to see the arrow coming. Let us now be silent together to create an opportunity for prayer or meditation. The reading is by that other Unitarian minister, Robert Fulgham. He's still with us. He's 86 now. He's still with us. This is a, a little essay of his called Dancers. Wrong book. Yes. When I get down and my life is log jammed and I need some affirmative action, I go where people dance. I don't mean places where people go to get drunk and then wobble around on the floor. I mean places who really like to dance, go to do that. I like dancers. Never met a serious dancer who wasn't a pretty fine human being. And I enjoyed the never ending pleasure of being surprised by just who the dancers are. It does me good to see a couple of ill-builts 
kind of fat and homely and solemn and all, get up on the floor and waltz like angels. When I see people like that on the street and start to look down my nose at them, a better voice in my head says, probably dancers. And I feel better about them and about myself. My favorite place, the Owl Tavern, has traditional jazz on Sunday nights from 6.30 to 9.30. The band plays swing music from the 30s and 40s from Chicago and New Orleans. Most of the people who show up are over 50, blue collar, one beard types who have to be at work early Monday morning not what you'd call a rowdy crowd. What you'd call them is dancers. I like to look around and find the champion dancer for the evening, an old guy wearing invisible house, slipper, in, invisible house slippers and his bathrobe, balding, white hair, short, wrinkled, the kind of sort of lists to starboard when he walks. One who you might think was strictly nursing home material if you saw him at a bus stop. But you see him here and you know, a dancer. And he usually has his wife with him, a bit younger, always fluffed up a bit for dancing and has been for 50 years. Check her shoes. If they are black with mid heels and a strap across the instep, it's a sure bet what she came for and what she's going to do. The music cranks up. He takes her by the hand and kind of limps onto the floor. It's an act just to set you up. And then it happens. She steps into a permanent spot formed by his embrace. The years fall away, and once again, Cinderella and Prince Charming move to the music in the room and the music in their hearts. It takes about 40 years to dance with a partner this way. Such ease, such grace, with all kinds of little moves that have been perfected without words. He dances flat-footed with an economy of motion. She responds to unseen suggestions with a, with a twirl out and around and back. Their eyes meet from time to time, and you know that you're seeing a pretty happy marriage there on the floor. Sometimes he asks another lady to dance, and somebody usually asks her, they make whoever they are dancing with look pretty good and feel pretty good too. An 81-year-old once asked me to dance on such an evening. I gave her my best and she stayed right with me. You're real good, honey, she said, as I escorted her to her seat and I lived off that compliment for a week. All this reminds me of something I heard about the Hopi Indians. They don't think there's much difference between praying and dancing, that both are necessary for a long life. They say that to be a useful Hopi is to be one who has a quiet heart and takes part in all the dances. Thank you. 
There's a passage from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible that is usually read at memorial services. And I will read it at David's memorial service a week from Saturday. Uh, for everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to lie, to, to die, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to seek, a time to lose, and so on. Usually, people who read it don't go as far as verse, verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 say this, I, this is the author of Ecclesiastes speaking, I know there is nothing better for us mortals to do than to enjoy ourselves as long as we live. And it is God's gift that we should eat and drink and take pleasure in our work. And to me, that's pretty much the message of Rick Maston's hymn, Let It Be a Dance. Through the good times and the bad times too, he says, let it be a dance. That attitude didn't come easily to him. Rick Maston struggled all his life with depression. And I'd like to read one more of his poems about a time when he was so depressed that he had decided to take his life. This poem is called The Bixby Bridge Incident. The Bixby Bridge is a, a bridge on the California coast near Big Sur. That's where he lived, Big Sur. Um, it's, a, it's a high bridge with the ocean far beneath, and uh, it's regularly used by people who want to kill themselves. And this, is, uh, this, is, this happened in the summer of 1971, uh, he, he did not kill himself. He wrote this poem uh, three months later. Okay, so he, he didn't actually kill himself. He was 42 that year. And here's the poem. The cup looked half empty. The big hand said 42 passed. And the word, if there was one, was tired. I was tired. Then suddenly the wind touched my hair and I became aware of myself up there on the bridge. A weary old bird ready to leap from the nest and fly blind to the breathing sea below. I calmly inched forward, a great sadness in my heart, my hair blowing. Then aware now I paused and listen to the night for the sound of a motor. And I looked for lights, but the world was empty. No one was coming to witness my final scene, the grand finale. And it was such a fantastic, dramatic moment, I decided to come back and tell you all about it instead. <laughs> Laughing, Shaking my head, I drove home. But it wasn't until I saw the shape of my own house that I discovered the cup had been half full all the time. Years ago, on the day of my birth, I was hung by my heels and swatted, and I cried, and I decided to suck air and live. On a bridge near Big Sur, California, in the summer of 71, I faced the same decision again. And as I write this, I feel I am three months old today. He struggled with depression all his life. Um, he died of acute metastatic prostate cancer in uh, the spring of 2008. And for, and he had, uh, been battling that for almost a decade. And through most of that time, he maintained a blog, that is a log on the internet, uh, that he maintained to encourage, give support to other men struggling with prostate cancer. And this is uh, his entry for August 30th, 2007. So this is about 10 months before he finally died. And again, it reveals that he can't take himself entirely seriously all the time. And it's just a wonderful quality. 
August was a month I could have done without. First, my wife of 54 years falls and breaks her hip and her wrist. Then I have to be catheterized because I couldn't pee anymore. He had so many tumors in his urinary tract <coughs> that he couldn't urinate. I must admit all this has made me feel pretty low down. Still, I found it kind of funny when I went into the bank on my way home from being catheterized and a friend of mine slaps me on the back and shouts, Rick, you look great. Thanks, I said. Fulgham talked about dancers. I'd like to tell you about a dancer I met once. Her name was Florence. She lived at a nursing home in Weymouth. This is a nursing home that I would visit regularly because one of the, the congregants in the Weymouth church lived there. And I happened to show up on a day and at a time when most of the residents were gathering in their function hall for uh, musical entertainment. A guitar player was gonna come and sing and he, he regularly came, you know, at least once a month, maybe more often. So they were gathering, in came Florence, tottering on her walker. She had a pretty blouse, a delicate cardigan, a long pearl necklace, black gloves, gray culottes, but she was bare-legged and had athletic socks on. And then I noticed her shoes. Fulgham had said, check her shoes. If they're black with mid heels and a strap across the instep, it's a sure bet what she came for. Well, Florence's shoes were like that, except they were gray. <coughs> the guitar player started, he started to sing his, uh, his voice was completely shot. I mean, he was croaking, either from too much singing or too many cigarettes, I don't know, but, but, but people enjoyed it anyway. And Florence, who was now sitting in a chair, started to dance. That is, she started to tap her feet alternately with the music and sway back and forth. And then she struggled up out of the chair and leaning on the walker, continued to dance, to move, to move. And then a member of the staff who had seen this before and knew Florence well, came and gently took away the walker and embraced Florence and the two of them danced together very slowly in a circle all around the room, keeping perfect time with the music. And then when Florence, Florence was back at her chair, um, she didn't sit down. She continued to dance, this time alone, really tottering, alone. But the staff member was right near her to catch her. And she made it again, all the way around the room, keeping perfect time, dancing, and got back to her chair the second time and collapsed in the chair. She was covered with sweat and a huge smile on her face. A dancer, a dancer. They say 90% of success is to show up and take part and pay attention. And that's what Florence was doing. And I'm reminded of what Fulgham said about the Hopis. He said, a useful Hopi is one who takes part in all the dances. Dancing is not about grace, but about taking part. Florence was a useful Hopi useful to herself, useful to everyone else. And I'm reminded that our ultimate freedom, our ultimate freedom, our most important freedom is our freedom to choose our attitude, to choose our attitude, to see the glass as half full or half empty. That's our decision. The Hopi said there wasn't much difference between dancing and praying. Um, I, I don't want to uh, make the service run too long, but I want to close by reading one other 
uh, essay by Fulgham about dancing. It's a kind of uh, companion to the essay I've already read. This is from a different book. This is from the, the kindergarten book. The book I, I started to read from incorrectly earlier. One portion of a minister's lot concerns the dying and the dead. The hospital room, the mortuary, the funeral service, the cemetery. What I know of such things shapes my life elsewhere in particular ways. It explains why I don't waste a lot of time mowing the lawn or washing my car. What I know of cemeteries and such also explains why I sometimes visit the Buffalo Tavern. This is a different dancing place. He lived in uh, near Seattle. So this is somewhere in suburban Seattle. The Buffalo Tavern is in essence mongrel America. Boiled down and stuffed into the buffalo on a Saturday night, the fundamental elements achieve a critical mass about 11 p.m. The catalyst is the house band, eight <clears throat> freaks frozen in the vibes of the 60s, playing stomp hell rockabilly with enough fervor to heal the lame and the halt. Mongrel America comes to the buffalo to drink beer, shoot pool, and dance. Above all, to dance, to shake their tails, and stomp and get rowdy and holler and sweat and dance. When it's Saturday night and the band is rocking and the crowd is rolling, there's no such thing as death. One such night, the Buffalo was invaded by a motorcycle club, trying hard to look like the Hells Angels and doing a pretty good job. These people were not in costume for a movie. And neither the men nor the ladies smelled like soap and water was an important part of their lives on anything like a daily basis. Then an Indian came in, an older man with braids and a beaded vest and army, sur sur army surplus pants and tennis shoes. He was really ugly. Now I'm fairly resourceful with words and I would give you a flashy description of this man's face if it would help, but there's no way around it. He looked in a word, ugly. He sat working on his Budweiser for a long time. When the band ripped into a scream out version of jailhouse rock, he moved. He shuffled over to one of the motorcycle mamas and invited her to dance. Most ladies would have refused, but she was amused enough to shrug and get up. Well, this ugly, shuffling Indian ruin could dance. He had the moves, nothing wild, just effortless action, subtle rhythm, the cool of a master, he turned his partner every which way but loose and made her look good. The floor slowly cleared. The band wound down, but the drummer held the beat and the motorcycle club rose up and shouted for the band to keep playing. And so the band kept playing. The Indian kept dancing. The motorcycle mama was finally exhausted and collapsed into her chair and the Indian danced on alone. The crowd started to clap the beat. The Indian danced with a chair. The crowd went crazy. The Indian held up his hands for silence as, as if to make a speech. Looking at the band and then the crowd, the Indian said, well, what are you waiting for? Let's dance. The band and the crowd went off like a bomb. People were dancing all through the tables to the back of the room and behind the bar. People were dancing in the restrooms and around the pool tables, dancing for themselves, for the Indian, 
for God, dancing in the face of hospital rooms, mortuaries, funeral services, and cemeteries. And for a while, nobody died. And now, for the support of this congregation, the morning offering will be uh, gratefully received and I hope freely given. This is the time of sharing joys and concerns. The theory is that a joy shared is multiplied and a concern or sorrow shared is divided. Donald commented earlier that the first hymn was very long. It was four pages of the hymnal. This is even longer. Uh, it takes five minutes to sing, but I, I love this. This is 354. Would you join, please, in singing our closing hymn, number 354, We Laugh, We Cry. Thank you. 
be a religion that like sunshine goes everywhere its temple all space its shrine the good heart its creed all truth its ritual works of love Amen. 